I have known senior chemistry majors with GPAs below 3.5 who have gone to medical school. And I also know of Washington University students with GPAs above 3.8 who are not admitted. And that's because GPA is just one of the criteria that medical schools use to evaluate students. And that's even more true for students in the basic sciences who intend to go to graduate schools. For graduate schools, research experience and strong letters of recommendation from faculty members are at least as important as GPA. Going to PhD programs, uh, 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 would be wonderful. You'd, you'd be very well qualified for uh, uh, really a lot of the top programs. Well, this is an easily answered one because you can go to the National Center for Education Statistics online and get government statistics on how many students are taking science degrees. And if you look at their website, you'll see that that number has been going up every year for the last 10 years. That's true in the physical sciences, in engineering, and in the biological sciences. At WashU, we actually see uh, an interesting thing that the same thing is true. Over the last 10 years, um, it's fluctuated up and down in terms of the percentage of students who declare biology or pre-medicine or something like that on their applications, but it's around 45 to 48 percent of the students. It sort of seems like it should be true, right? We've been doing this for a very long time in all these science disciplines, but um, it's really amazing to me that frequently um, there are new discoveries made that are just completely unexpected. Well, it's true that we know more now than we've ever known in the past, but as the amount that we know grows, the boundary of our knowledge also grows. As we answer more questions, we find more questions that need to be answered. So I think it's not true that there's less to do now than there was in the past. I can tell you from personal experience that, that isn't true. All three of my current physicians are women. And diversity is also expanding in the basic sciences, both in terms of gender and in nationality. White males are still overrepresented on many science faculties, but that's changing. For example, in our recent searches in chemistry, at least half of our number one candidates have been women. I have to actually give a really a plug for our department, our biology department. Our department is about 33% women faculty, um, most of them full professors, which is a really high number of women faculty. I think um, wh one of the hardest things for being a scientist who runs a lab is dealing with people. And it's like 80% of what you have to do in science, deal with other people. You uh, work with students, uh, you uh, talk to colleagues, you uh, publish papers, you write papers, you go to meetings, you give presentations. Without the interchange of ideas among people in science, you don't make any progress. Science is a huge and complicated activity and it involves people working in enormous collaborations, sometimes thousands of people, as well as small groups of 10 or 2 or 3, as well as loners. You need all these different kinds of people. And even in the big collaborations, you need a variety of people. You need people who are very gregarious and outgoing and find out what else is going on out there in the research world and spread the results that the group is finding. But you also need quieter, behind-the-scenes people who will work to make sure everything is going correctly. And you need loners who will pursue radical new ideas for the collaboration to pick up if they work. So you don't just need to be a loner. We need every kind of people in science.